Hello, and welcome to Plant Moran's Executive Series. Today we're going to cover strategies for effective customer growth. With me, I have Darren Gifford and Ted Morgan from our strategy practice. Welcome. We look forward to a lively discussion. But before we get too far down the road, we'd like to have a polling question to get a pulse of the audience. While we give you a few seconds to respond, if you have other questions during the session, please make sure that you enter those. We'll try and get to them at the end. If we don't, we promise we'll, get, we'll circle back with you within 48 hours to answer that question. And if you have a topic you'd like to see covered in the future, we're interested in that as well, and we'll circle back to you later today on that. We all know customer loyalty is a critical driver of survival and growth, yet so many companies miss the opportunity with existing customers while they pursue, spend a lot of time and resources pursuing other customers that frankly may not fit with their strategies. So uh, we'd like to start out today to talk about what strategies you have for customer growth and uh, hopefully at the end of this you can tell us, uh, answer the question, what's your strategy for customer growth? So Darren, can you tell us a bit about the value of an existing customer? Absolutely, Gordon, uh, thanks. The, we believe existing customers really are your most valuable asset uh, that you have as a company. And so often uh, when it comes to a downturn or the threat of a downturn or slowdown, the immediate reaction of, of companies is, I need to go find new customers. Well, what happened to that existing customer that was so valuable to you before? So, uh, so our view is that you know, going to your existing customers, really exploring uh, that relationship and getting to understand them even better uh, is easier to do uh, than to try and go out and find, and, you know, find a new uh, partner in something, uh, to, to go out and, and make a cold call on somebody else. Uh, we also think it's easier if there's any issues, it's easier to resolve those because you already know each other, you can work on those kinds of things. You can really uh, talk about how do you become much more of an entrenched uh, partner uh, in their business would be the approach with existing customers. Um, you know, within the, the existing customers as well, uh, we also think that you really need to focus on probably your most loyal customers to, that, to you as a business. Uh, they tend to, those loyal customers will tend to buy more over time, they'll be easier for you to work with over time. Uh, and frankly, you should, uh, if you're adding value, you should be able to extract a, a premium from that relationship by working with them over time. Uh, and the key is to adding value, of course, in that relationship. Now, now there is one caveat to that. So, so not all loyal customers um, are good for your business. So I think we got to take a little deeper look into that. So, you know, some customers can be uh, inordinately burdensome on your on your uh, your company's resources, and that could detract you from aligning with customers that, frankly, are a better fit with your organization. Um, so that's kind of one point. Uh, a second kind of caveat point that Darren would be, you know, some customers could, could perhaps that have been loyal could perhaps be on the on the cusp of leaving. And I think uh, for a, either a small price decrease from a competitor or just a small incremental add uh, from a service line perspective. And you, know, you wouldn't necessarily con you know, consider those customers loyal. So I think part of this discussion, we'll try to figure out you know, what kind of to bifurcate those customers who have been with you for a long time, but those who have true loyalty that, and have a good align with your organization. Thanks, Ted. Uh, one of the things that we li like are examples. So do you have any examples of, of companies that have employed successful customer strategies and really leveraged a loyal customer basis. Sure, I'll, I'll kick things off. Uh, right. Let's talk about something we all have. We have smartphones, like it or not, these day and age. So um, Sam, Samsung and Apple really control this market. They actually mm -hmm. have about 95% market share globally. And uh, so we looked at the, the loyalty rates for these uh, two companies. And Samsung's loyalty rate, and the loyalty rate is basically the chances that an existing customer is going to buy the same product mm -hmm. in, on their next phone. And uh, Samsung has, has a nice loyalty rate of about 65%, so they're converting about two-thirds of their customers. Who's at Apple's rates, and it's actually 85%, which is pretty significant. So you're 20, 20 points above, and we said, okay, well, so what? What does that mean? And we actually looked at that as it relates to the Apple Watch. So as we all know, the Apple Watch launched, um, launched about a year ago in the spring of 2015. And um, f frankly, the technical pundits and, the, and some of the technical reviews and the, the magazines and technical journals have said, you know, it's... It's just a mediocre product, and it didn't get slammed in, in the media, but it certainly it wasn't Apple's you know, best product. And despite that, if you ask Apple, they're, they're very pleased with the sales they've been able to generate, mostly by leveraging millions and millions of loyal customers of iPads, iPhones, Apple TVs. And so I think it's a really powerful story of how a, a loyal customer base can just be so loyal to a, to, a, to a particular brand that they're willing to buy product kind of a bit irrespective of some of the prop of the, of the of the characteristics of the actual product itself. Mm -hmm. So a pretty powerful example to start us. Yeah, yeah let, me, let me take another example that uh, uh, may be a little closer to home uh, for, for those who are around the auto industry. Uh, so Tesla has is a, is a become a, a 
just a, a, an outstanding brand name uh, out in the marketplace. Uh, it's not only in the auto industry, but you know the people around the world marvel at uh, Tesla. You can see that by the just the market value of this small little company that's you know, two to three times that of some of the other big you know, automotive OEMs at this point. Um, so I worked with Tesla uh, back when they were first starting up. Uh, it was quite a fascinating experience. As before, they were such a big brand name, um, and uh, you know part of their strategy in that case, you know, first was to create a great product, which they do. Uh, but right behind that was then creating that great customer relationship, and so you know they've worked very hard, and they've, they've frankly they've copied Apple for many of those those kinds of things. They they actually hired Apple's um, one of Apple's key guys to become their marketing manager early on in the process, and so he established Tesla stores out there, a lot of, like like Apple stores sure. in this case, um, and so you know so, so it's not which is part of the conflict around there as well. So that's not the dealer franchise model, but but uh, you know, with those Apple with those Tesla stores, excuse me. Uh, they've established such a relationship that 85% you know, of their current customers have said in surveys they plan to buy another Tesla in the future. Uh, and so you know, they've, they were, uh, in, and with that, they're also looking at establishing a new model, a smaller version of the current Tesla, because the current Model S uh, typically retails for $70,000 and above, definitely on the higher luxury end. Uh, but um, they're able, able to secure uh, over 400,000 uh, reservations now at $1,000 a piece uh, for a new model. Uh, Model 3 is what they're calling them. So these are smaller versions of the Tesla uh, coming in and launching in a couple of years for around $35,000 and up, I'm sure, with uh, some of the features going in place. Um, you know, that generated $400 million of cash to the company just by that simple step alone. Uh, that's, that's, you know, we, we see, it's, uh, see that as an extreme example of really good customer loyalty, uh, even pre-customer loyalty, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, their first two product offerings, as I said, were, were very high priced. Uh, the next version, Coming at that level um, is going to be you know, half of that. And then uh, some of the other things that they found is that the Tesla buyers that previously uh, didn't own a car up in that higher price range uh, actually have also said that they plan to buy another one uh, right away as well. So, so that price doesn't seem to scare them away. Those are some great examples of consumer products companies. What about industrial company loyalty? Have you, have you seen much in that area? Or you have any examples there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so l let's talk about Cummins. So, Cummins is um, a large diesel engine manufacturer. Uh, so by the numbers, they're the number one uh, market share leader in North America for diesel engines. And uh, they also uh, have lead rankings in customer satisfaction. And so again, for this discussion, we said, well, so what does that mean? So we looked into it and he said, okay, uh, they've really, Cummins has done a really nice job of, ex of taking a very good core product and leveraging it into different services and products. So now they're into emission controls, turbo systems, and distributions. And so the results of it is that in the last six years, they've been able to uh, nearly double the size of the company in terms of revenue. And perhaps even more importantly, they've been able to grow profits at a, at a, at a faster clip at about two and a half times rate during that six year period. So really impressive results, I suppose, on the, on the, on the income statement. And I think from a product and service diversification, as much as this core product has driven their company over the last uh, several decades, you know, it only now, diesel engine only uh, accounts for about, ha about half of the company's revenue in total. So a very scalable story here of how the company has really taken a, a strategic you know, approach of growing a loyal customer base into some broad and uh, different service and product lines. So those are impressive leading edge companies. Can, can you sort of summarize what their key strategies were to take advantage of customer loyalty? Um, sure, I'll, I'll, st I'll start, uh, Ted. So one, sure. uh, solving uh, customer challenges. Um, you know, Apple uh, clearly did that in the beginning. I think Steve Jobs is memorably quoted as that the uh, uh, the smartphones are not smart <laughs> back when they first launched the iPhone, and he was right. And clearly, he's established a whole new uh, market segment uh, with the, with the Apple iPhone. And so, solving that customer challenge was one of the keys to success there. But, uh, I think another one I'd also go back to Tesla as well is that uh, they've created a memorable customer experience uh, in many ways uh, because it's an electric car. Um, because it's actually a very fast electric car as well, uh, with a great with great ride and handling. But um, you know, when you buy it from their stores, um, it's a it's a it's a it's a memorable experience just in the interchange and going to meet with them directly, uh, talking to them, uh, and then uh, if there's any service problems, uh, Tesla works very hard at uh, coming to you. So if there's a service issue, they come to you. They try and get ahead of the game uh, with uh, anything that is a product issue or product recall related type of an, uh, an activity. Uh, so they're trying to minimize any negative impact to their customers and make sure that, that uh, they're completely engaged in, uh, in, your, your, in your lifestyle, really, so that there's not an interruption because you, your car's not working today. So, so I'll jump in there, too. So we have, again, coincidentally, uh, Tesla and Apple have the same customer, status, customer loyalty rate at about 85%. So they also have a, you know, I think would be, 
buying into that tenant of having a, a memorable customer experience. So as we think about you know, going into an Apple store, I mean, these are effectively technology playgrounds, right, where you have devices and their, their products in the stores uh, in, in high quantity, staffed with high quantity, if not, and of course, a lot of those are sales associates, but they're there to effectively celebrate the product, celebrate the culture of what's of Steve Jobs in Wozniak we were able to start. And so, whether you're young, you're old, or you know a lot about the product, or you don't know a lot about the product, I think it's a very welcoming environment to start the customer experience. And of course, if you want to, if you want to buy a product, they'll happily execute that process in a very non-haggle, straightforward process. So when you walk out of that store with your bag after spending hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, you feel good about it, meaning that you didn't get sold something you know, by a hard-pressed salesperson. And I think that really kind of gets either a, an existing or a new customer off to a great start from that, back to that memorable experience and kind of, again, just kind of putting another deposit into the customer loyalty aspects of it. Mm -hmm. yeah, if, I, if I go to um, the further example, uh, a business-to-business -business relationship like Cummins that we just talked about, mm -hmm. so it's exceeding your customer's expectations uh, is one of the keys to Cummins success, I think, uh, because it is a, a commercial customer uh, and, and their engines or their parts um, are going into you know, businesses out there because your trucks are basically your business in many of those kinds of, in that in industry segment, uh, you know, their focus in is on uptime for their customers. So, because if they're, if they're down for even you know, half an hour, uh, that's revenue lost to many of those mm -hmm. customers. So Cummins yeah. is all about exceeding customer expectations, making sure that their product is out there and, and serving them. I know one of the things we try to do at Plant Ran is do client satisfaction visits, uh, a lot of client satisfaction surveys to really have a sense of that how they feel about the service we're providing. How, how common is that, or how, how good at companies are really getting a formalized feedback from their, from their customers? Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's the simple you know, answer to that. Uh, we find that so many times that um, customers uh, think that they really understand, their, they, their cu our customers think they understand their customers, put it that way. Uh, and, uh, and many times when you sit down and talk to them, they don't solicit a more formal feedback from them. Uh, they don't go out and uh, have the conversations with more than just the, maybe the single interface in their case. Uh, we have, um, on the bad example side, uh, you know, uh, there's a company I know of that actually uh, we, were, we were supporting them on the customer side and, and they had uh, difficulty with getting accurate contact information for many of their customers. And some of that uh, is inherent in today's day and age. There's so much done on the internet and orders come in over the internet that it's, you know, it becomes uh, almost, um, uh, it, it gets a little too comfortable. When mm -hmm. orders come in, you're not quite sure exactly where they're coming from all the time, but the revenues stay up. Uh, you know, that can you know, give you an artificial sense that mm -hmm. you really understand your customers. And we find that uh, it's, you, know, you really need to take a hold of that and drill into to what those customers want and get to understand them better. Because uh, when things start to get tight, that's when it also gets more difficult. If you don't know your customers uh, and the orders just disappear, uh, then you wonder what happened to you. So we'd say that yeah, it's really important to go out and get that customer feedback much more often than what happens today. Well, and I'll make one more point. I think, so customer feedback, you know, I think we have a lot of companies that just really pride themselves in being problem solvers. They wake up every day trying to solve their clients or their, their customers' challenges, which is highly commendable, I and mean, it's a great way to, to leverage relationships and, and to grow your business. I think we just got to be careful, though, we don't get in the rut of solving problems, and I think uh, just for, for, just for any, any customer or any client, I think this and gathering customer feedback, I think, can really help that. Um, because you got to make sure you're doing it for the right customer, not just a customer or a client. So there's, there's, there's a lot of things we can get down, get a little road to eat down that uh, can get us in, into a little bit of trouble. Uh, what, <coughs> what do you suggest that companies do to really further develop that relationship with their customers? Well, uh, we, we believe that one of the, the key parts is actually to, to tackle this in a more formal <coughs> process. And so really have an established, I'll call it structured approach to it uh, to really uh, identify what is your, strat your customer strategy, if you want to think of it that way. And so um, we have a model, a uh, customer strategy, fr strategy framework that uh, we've, we've developed and have a, uh, our methodology to approaching that with our clients in this case is to, to use that structure to help them uh, through the process to really get to what's a customer strategy because it, it really is something that re requires a fair amount of assessment and analysis and preparation. So we start really with, uh, first of all, uh, creating that vision to serve your customers. And we, we view that as that doesn't happen at the beginning, but it happens throughout. So you'd start with that uh, identifying with the, we, facil we facilitate that with our clients many times on, you know, what, uh, what is your vision for your customers and for your business? How does that work? Now let's go back and let's revisit for more of the details that the, is the vision you created, how does your company work to perform that? Is it, so we go through and assess the customer themselves uh, and help them assess themselves to establish a baseline. So really to see uh, how well are we doing 
uh, with that vision today. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, many times uh, when we go through and look at that from the capabilities and the plans and their current customer performance and even how they might rate their relationship or get that external information in a survey from their customers uh, may not fit so well. And so then part of the challenge then is, is, is trying to figure out what's, what's the gap in there uh, which may lead to, which should lead to a discussion around uh, what do you want your core competencies to be you know, with your customer? You know, what are the customer needs that are really required uh, out in, in the marketplace? And the customer is usually very good about the, you know, telling you those kinds of things, uh, but you should also be prepared to understand what, those need, what you think those needs are going to be out there. Because most people um, you know, should have a good, they do have a good understanding of their industry and their segment, uh, but uh, like I said, they may, need, may not make that, that relationship link back to their customers themselves. I think the, the last part of it we'd say is on the market and the, the perception in the marketplace uh, is also important to consider as part of uh, that customer assessment process. Uh, and, uh, and that's where having a survey uh, conducted, some feedback, uh, but also then you know, looking at your competitors. Because most of the time, even in that feedback, your customers don't want to tell you a lot about your competitors. So you may have to go out and figure out from a different source what your competitors uh, may be doing out there and how, the, how you're positioned against those competitors. And mm -hmm. we take all those factors together we call it uh, synthesis. So how do you synthesize all this information together uh, into creating what would be a customer strategy that you could use going forward? Uh, and the last part of this um, in our, our framework would also be then taking that and creating what we call actionable plans. So it's, uh, what, do you, what do you do about it? So great strategy, if it sits on the shelf, then you haven't changed anything in your business. So what are the actions you can take that uh, uh, can be done, and then how do you follow up as well? So really monitoring progress uh, in that, and it doesn't have to be weekly necessarily, but we'd say at, at minimum quarterly, it should come up as a topic for discussions. And how are we progressing? If, you know, we, are, we, you know, are we doing better with this particular customer um, or worse? Or if it's a new customer we're trying to, to solicit in this case, you know, how, do we, how are we positioning ourselves there? So, so it's, a, it's a fairly, we think it's, a, it's probably one of the more important things that a com company can do. And it's probably one of the things that companies uh, don't do formally nearly enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Darren, and I'll, I'll go in to kind of come back and bring a little more color to, to the model that you briefly went through. And I think just on the, on the customer assessment side, I think we want to kind of look at this holistically from the organization perspective. You know, let's get down to facts. What are my growth rates with the customer or the client? What are my profitability rates? We have to know the facts on the table to understand that as kind of a baseline. But let's talk operations. How easy is the client to work with or the customers to work with? That matters. Mm -hmm. And I think from a strategic perspective, uh, and, and sales perspective, where's the growth going to come from? So are we leveraging the same relationships we have for one, two, or maybe 20 years? Or are there other divisions within the, the business units of the, of the organization at the customer level that, you could, that could potentially, potentially be penetrated? So I think having a good kind of inventory of that is, is just a great background, background to help you understand you know, what, what the ultimate customer strategy will be. Well, one of the things you mentioned that I don't hear a lot about is really understanding our customer strategy. And that just seems critical to me if you really want to serve and provide value Absolutely. to them. So we talked a lot about <coughs> existing customers. How important is it, Darren, to, to um, diversify the, the, the client base or the customer base? Um, well, it, it is important over the long run. Uh, so we focus a lot on existing customers because um, in, I'd say, the majority of cases, we haven't fully exhausted developing that relationship with our existing customers. And I think if we don't fully understand what's our value add to our existing customers, it's very hard to go out into the marketplace and then solicit new customers to get that same kind of relationship established. So that's why we like to start there first. Uh, that being said, that over the long run, it all, it's, it, it's important to also develop new customers out in the market as well so that uh, you can diversify some of your risk in the marketplace. And then the, the challenge will be how to go do that and who to go do it with. And so it's, it's always easier when we go back to our framework to understand what are your competencies that you provide to your customers? What are those needs that you're, you're improving uh, for them, uh, adding value to them? And so choosing customers in that case that are related, uh, that uh, you can take those same competencies to, uh, that same expertise, that same innovation or value to that customer, uh, is going to be important to, to establishing a, a little better path to a longer term relationship. Uh, and as well as then looking, if you're looking at other segments or other markets to, to grow into, uh, you know, what's the relationship in those, those markets? So if you're a machine tool manufacturer, uh, you probably don't want to move into consumer goods you know, right, you know, to make that jump most likely. You're going to want to look at some things that are related probably more around machining, industrial uh, areas, those kinds of things. You know, what's, what's, the, what's that natural linkage, that, that tangent that can, uh, can, can really grow your business from? So we would, we would advise you know, proceeding along that path to really try and grow your business. Uh, but it's going to be an investment. 
when you're looking for new customers. It's, and there's no doubt about it. It's, that's why we like existing customers first because we think that's, a, that's, that's probably lower hanging fruit uh, initially to really get the, you know, really grow that customer base. That's terrific. At this point, we're going to pause and look at our polling question, and that is, uh, what topics would you like to see us cover in future executive series? Uh, and we will, as I mentioned, we'll get to the, 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 your uh, questions from the audience here, and, and uh, we won't be able to cover them all, so again, we will get back to you within 48 hours of so the ones we don't get to. But the first question, so what steps should you take first to get to know your customer better? Either one of you? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go first, Gordon. Uh, so I think there's a couple of tactical ways to do this. I think one is to have you know, really good relationships within your customer. Um, I mean, clearly, if, if you know someone or, or, or the, the key individuals within, an within your customer's organization that frankly can tell you the answer key, um, that's great. And that, that's a luxury to have, and we don't have that at a lot of customers, but for the ones that we do where we have a great relationship manager, that can ultimately be leveraged very well. To the extent we don't have that, I think we really, the secondary way to look at it is, you know, it, it's highly convenient if, you're, if your business is directly aligned with your customer's business. You kind of naturally get a, a good sense for what some of their, their customers, their, their strategies and their challenges may be. Um, if you have neither of those two, it can be a bit more of a challenge. So I, I think, um, you know, I think the question is always, well, well, what can you do with that? And I think if, you know, we talk to a lot of companies that want to kind of get into the dance early, so to speak, with their customers, either helping them solve a, a problem uh, or bring a new client service or a new product line to the market. And uh, I think it's the folks that get invited early to the dance are the ones that can demonstrate that they do know their customer strategies or their customer challenges. So I think that's the, why, that answer the questions of why would I need to know that. Yeah. I think that's really critical. So we, we see a lot of companies time and time again say, say to us, I want to be involved early. I think the customers say yes to that or they say, well, you have to understand my business first. Yeah, I, I like to call it, how do you get into their head, right? That's, that's, that's the key part of uh, for, sure. for success. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, the second question uh, that we have is, is an interesting one I've heard quite a bit, uh, and that's, you know, so I have a direct sales force. What do I do with them? Well, it's interesting on that. That's a very, from a business to business relationship. Uh, it's, there's a different expectation, I'd say, uh, in a direct sales force versus sales representatives or reps out there. And uh, that's, that's one of the key things to identify right away because many, of our, many of, of our clients have both in some cases. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, reps are going to be a little more difficult to deal with because uh, they are independent, they're selling other product out there. But for a direct sales force, one of the key parts is, is making sure, uh, since they, they work for you and you're managing them, is how do you make sure that their incentives are aligned around retention and not just out seeking, you know, constantly seeking new customers and new business. That's part of, you know, it has to be part of the challenge in there is how to reward them uh, for, the, for the sales that they make um, in the existing customers uh, and, 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 considering, and also considering you know, how does their, their pay or their commission or bonuses, how, how does that relate to those existing customers. Um, getting more of the organization involved would be another key part of that. So it's not just the salesperson who's out interacting with those customers because in most cases uh, we see uh, it, it should be a team game. It should be uh, engineering if you're a manufacturer or manufacturing sometimes. Uh, it, can be, it can be the finance guys, uh, because they're going to be involved in some of the pricing kind of decisions. Uh, the management team as well, if it's, a, if it's a really key strategic customer. So how do you make sure you have a more of a team approach to the whole thing so that you're not the lone person out there? Um, the other thing with many sales forces we see uh, is that uh, they're expected to be the relationship guys out there, uh, but they need to have more technical knowledge to really have a good relationship uh, you know, with their customers. And so ha making sure they have the right kind of training and interaction, the right kind of background, uh, to be able to, to sell that kind of product as well as, as, well as just being the, the handshaker uh, with the customers is one of the key parts that we see that's uh, it's going to be really viable for companies um, to, to ha have the image and perception with their customers of adding value and innovation and those kinds of things that are going to be important for growing that relationship. You know, terrific, and I think the last question that we have time for today is uh, your examples dealt with well-known large companies. Uh, do you have an example of a middle market company uh, that grew their customer relationship? Well, well um, I do have one that comes to mind and it may relate to many in, in the audience. Uh, it would be a more of a middle market sized manufacturing business. And uh, that particular business, interestingly, um, um, uh, st was struggling because they had a, a few you know, very good customers and they were concerned um, that uh, they had completely tapped out uh, that particular customer base. Um, and and we, we sat down to help them with that customer strategy. One of the things that they talked about uh, was um, you know, that their primary contact was purchasing. And so it's back to the example I, I cited earlier, which is, okay, so who else do you meet with at, at the customer, number one? So identifying who is the right set of relationships and, and how can you broaden that uh, beyond that. 
Uh, but then secondly was uh, really uh, analyzing that customer and understanding what the customer's issues were going forward. Were, what were their product plans, for example? What were their product strategies? How do you prepare for uh, when you do have meetings with them that you already have some of the answers in your mind, not just going in cold and saying, tell me about your problems, but having an idea what those problems are in advance so that you actually have a strategy in place to help them with their problems. Uh, that helped them immensely, frankly, in building out their existing customers and frankly, in expanding into other customers that were related to that because they, that, that, that was a much more productive discussion that they had um, and it was also perceived as a much higher value added uh, discussion around um, going forward and the, the customer looked at them in a different light at that point. They weren't just a commodity anymore, they were actually a business partner helping them. Thank you. That wraps up our session today. Uh, please join us next week for a session on cutting through the data analytics hype. If you haven't signed up yet, uh, please go to executives.plantmoran.com. This program is part of the Plant Moran Do Better program, and it focuses on, on trying to help our clients do just that, do better. So thanks for attending, and here's to customer growth and doing better together. <laughs>